Yes, well, it was getting there. <laughs> and then when I had a sprinkler system installed, I found out, wow, I can put a control module in there. I can control it from my phone. This is really cool. And then I upgraded my router. Oh, wow. <laughs> Everything stopped. <laughs> I'm going to give away a million dollar opportunity right here, right now, to everyone in this room. And you can fight over it, I don't care. If somebody would come up with a system where I would say, I just upgraded my router, and I said, okay, I will reconnect all your smart devices for you in the next five minutes, you would sell, you would not be able to keep, you would not be able to go to sleep because you'd be selling so much. So, yeah. so the Nest, of course, worked right away. So that was no problem. That's up and running. You want to keep bridge the route of the route? Just turn it into a bridge. Well, that's what I should have done. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. What did he say? What did he say? If I had set up a bridge so that all the smart devices went to that instead of the router, then I could do anything all day with the router. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. You sell a bridge to everybody. Say, you got a smart home? Look after this bridge, and you can upgrade your router whenever you want. No problem. I got the lights working again, although that took a couple of days. The sprinkler system still doesn't work. The Echo Dots had to be completely reset, which means they lost all the settings I had. Oh. <laughs> I was like, what? That's crazy. So anyway, trying, trying to make your life simpler, it gets worse. <laughs> that's why Grandpa's always grumbling. <laughs> really? If you want to help choose the title of the book, I, like the um, I put a little poll on the website. Find a car's got to roll and I down. think I ended up building it with um, with gravity forms just for the fun of it. I tried Caldera forms. I tried this other one that after a half hour I threw it out. I don't remember its name. And uh, and I wanted to stay away from the specific poll plugins just because I've used them before. I thought, I want to try something different, see what capabilities these things have. And uh, so it was fun. So it's free if you want to go on there and say, oh, I like this. I've got like eight different titles for the things like, um, <coughs> if you speak slowly, I won't look so stupid, is one of the titles. Another one was, been there, done that, like a hundred times. <coughs> That was based on a conversation with my wife when we are around 4th of July and she's like, oh, did you, were you planning on going to see and uh, fireworks with the kids this week, this, this year? And I said, no, you know, what is it? And she drive down to this area where everybody's driving down to. Then you got to sit with a bunch of people you don't know and crying kids and then you got to try to, then you watch the stuff that you've seen before, for the most part, for like 15 minutes, that's it, and then you're done. Then you got to fight traffic getting back home, but no, I've been there, I've done that like a hundred times. I'm not going to do it anymore. And she was like, what? And I said, oh. Yeah, I gotta write another grandpa's guide. <laughs> talking, about, talking about your smart home, where's the end point to all that? When does life get get too easy for us? I mean, you're going through all this hassle to try to make things easier. Exactly. And every time I do it, it just gets more headaches. So. Yeah, and growing up, I mean, you never had that problem. I was telling her, I'm still trying to find a car that's got the roll down, the manual roll down w windows on it's it. All <laughs> yeah. it should have called me. But it still had oh, a yeah. USB port. I didn't get power windows until I think the 90s, just because I thought, I don't want this window to stop and break yeah. <laughs> in a thunderstorm. Right. Yeah. And they do break, you know, the motors yeah. do wear out, yeah. and, yeah. and those aren't cheap. So. Okay. Thank you all for coming. I hope you're enjoying uh, WordCamp Jacksonville, WC Jax, uh, 2018. My very first work camp was up here in Jacksonville two years ago, and I found it so enlightening and enjoyable. I went to the Tampa one, which was much closer to me, uh, that summer, and then last year I went to the Orlando one, and now I'm back here because they said, hey, we're looking for speakers. I thought, yeah, I can talk about something. I can talk about a lot of things. But one of the things that really gets to me <laughs> are the plugins, and I came across I get a lot of, <coughs> I get involved in a lot of stuff that wastes time. So, and a lot of it is this get rich quick schemes where somebody says, oh yeah, I've got a free webinar, you're going to make millions of dollars, 
you just come now, and I know it's coming. So when you sign up for this afterwards, for this many hundreds of dollars, I got a... Could you close that door? <coughs> sure. Thank you. Can you close the door behind Sorry? Can you close the door behind Thanks. And so, as I build websites, I've got six or seven of my own. I've helped three or four other people. Um, I always come across these problems with plugins. And one of the feeds I get is from a salesperson, and they basically said that um, plugins or websites have specific purposes. So what I'm going to cover today is to look at what's the purpose of your website. And there's basically two actions, and they're opposite of each other, that you want your visitor to uh, perform based on what type of website you have. And there are four categories that this guy breaks down, and a lot of other sites have also listed them. And we're going to go over hosting, third-party services, and plugins. They all do, in some cases, similar things. So when do you choose which one you want to do something? Then we'll look at core plugins that every site should have, that I think every site should have. And there's one missing up here, which if you were in the first presentation this morning in this room, they didn't mention it, but it came to mind, and so I thought, oh, we should talk about that too, and I'll add that. Then we'll look at specific plugins based on what your purpose is. <laughs> then I'll show you a simple bonus feature, free tool, which you can either set up yourself in two minutes or you can download in five minutes. And then we'll have focused audience questions before lunch, assuming everybody's still here before lunch. Or you can ask me questions all during the, the uh, presentation. I don't mind that either. I might even answer them. <laughs> so what is the purpose of your website? <clears throat> One of the things you want the person to do is you want the visitor to stay there as long as possible and hopefully buy something. If they do that, you're, you've got a store. You've got a storefront, you've got e-commerce, you have products to sell, things to download. Uh, the other one is you're, you've got a content-driven site. And those, you want the person to click on something. You want to click on an affiliate link. You want them to click on a Google AdSense ad. Something that generates revenue for you. So you want them on the site as long as possible. If you read any of these newspaper sites, you'll see they have ads all over the place on them. And that's how they make their revenue, by you clicking on the ad and seeing what's the top thing that you can do with your mortgage now that nobody else has done in the last 50 years. And if you buy something, they get revenue from it. Or if you click on it, they get revenue from it. So in this case, you want the visitor to be on your site as long as possible. The other one is you want them on and off as quick as possible. You want them to either contact you, either call you, email you, fill out a form, or enroll in something that you're offering. These sites fall under two categories. One, the obvious one, is lead generation. And the second one is they call a company brochure. Company brochure meaning basically, oh yeah, what does this company do? Let me take a look at their site. Oh, they do this, they do that, they have some pretty pictures. They're family oriented, they're the best in the area, you know, that kind of stuff. So you can get to learn more about the company and decide, do you want to hire them for something or interview them to hire? Now let's move on to the three different areas where you can add functionality to your WordPress site. And we're going to look at, first, the hosting provider. Your hosting provider, based on the level that you're paying for, gives you certain capabilities as far as the maintenance of your site goes, mostly. So they'll do typically a backup and restore service. Um, I use SiteGround, and I get automatic backups every night. Anytime they do a core WordPress update, they back it up before they do the update. So if I check it and say, hey, I need a rollback, I, I can get a rollback. They have a premium service now where they can even do immediate restores for you for a certain amount of money. So that's one option for doing backups and restores. They also have security. <coughs> and I didn't learn about this until probably last year. If you go into cPanel down into the security area, you can actually block IP addresses right there and they'll never get to your site. So if you look at your spam and start seeing where the spam is coming from, 
I was getting a lot of stuff from Czechoslovakia and Poland, and I'm like, I don't know anybody over there. So I just went in and said, block these IPs, and block these countries, whatever, and this man disappeared. So as a first level of defense, that's really pretty nice, and I didn't have to install a, install a plugin to do it. Now let's go back to that. Let's go forward. Now let's look at third party services. When I say services, I'm talking about third parties. Other companies that provide things for you so you don't have to do it yourself. These are things like email, like MailChimp, Constant Contact, all those. They take the email off your site to a third site. And the benefit of that, obviously, is if you end up being called a scammer or a fisher, it can actually hurt your, your site and your host. Uh, you get in all sorts of trouble. So this way it moves it off. Uh, a lot of them offer <coughs> free tiers when you're starting out, and then as you get more, you can pay for it. Another one is payment processing, and this is really big because um, of the thing called PCI compliance. You don't want any credit card information on your website. Uh, so PayPal, Stripe, all those do payment processing for you. What these services will do is they'll dictate some of the plugins that you're going to put on your site because in some cases the plugin may offer this functionality for free and in other cases you may have to pay an additional uh, premium to get that functionality. And typically what I found is the services that have a basic level you can typically get for free and then if they have some advanced levels your plugin will require payment to get uh, set up for those. Plugins, over 54,000 on WordPress.org alone. And one of my frustrations with this is I can't sort them in any way that I can tell. They're out of date. They're, of course, they're free, which is good, and a lot of them link to premium features. But <clears throat> if you go searching for, for them, you'll see just sometimes I'll search for something and I'll get 20 pages. <coughs> By the time I'm on page six or seven, it's like this works with version 3.5 that was updated 10 years ago, and it's like I don't want, I don't even want this in my list. I don't care about it. There are other locations, and these typically have premium only uh, plugins, and I'll just list a few of them here because there's a whole bunch of them. There's Elegant Themes, Code Canyon, Theme Forest, and Envato. Um, or you could probably name another dozen. But this is just an example. If you want to find a specific plugin or a capability that you're not seeing and one that's in the repository, take a look at some of these and you can find uh, something that might be a little more specialized for what you're trying to do. Core plugins you should install. Obviously, the first category is security and anti spam. Second is search engine optimization and analytics. The third would be you're gonna have to, if you're doing a third-party service, you're gonna have to install plugins that handle those services. <coughs> uh, backup, which at this point I would consider optional, even though people say, oh yeah, you should install a backup. Um, and I'll get into that when we go over that. And the fifth one is page builder, which is probably the only one up there that is not related to. <coughs> the basic maintenance of your website, but it's more actually for building a website. And I'll go into why I love page builders and specifically Elementor and Elementor Pro. Right. So, thank you. Security and anti-spam. I, as I said, I use SiteGround. SiteGround offers a free Let's Encrypt SSL certificate. Are we going to get a copy of this? It's, it'll be on... Um, they have like a place where you can get the copies of all the presentations. Okay. I'm not sure where that is. Um, but if not, you can always go to my website. I'll have it on there as well and you can download it from there. So Let's Encrypt puts an SSL certificate on your website for free. And if you actually host your domain with them, which I don't, and there's a reason I'll tell you about, um, they will give you a wildcard SSL certificate now that will cover all your subdomains for that same domain. Where to me it's like, ah, if I just have to install another certificate, I'll install another one. Um, because I use Name Silo for my uh, domain name because it's the cheapest one around and gives me everything for 
one set price. You can also, as I mentioned before, block IP addresses from your host. You can use a specific WordPress plugin, and I listed three of the popular ones up there. Um, I believe Securi is not free, but um, WordFence has a free one, and I'll give you a little um, personal experience with WordFence. I put it in. I really liked it. Every time I logged in, it would tell me, hey, so-and-so logged into your website, so I could tell if somebody who I didn't authorize was logging in. By that time, it'd probably be too late, but at least I would see that somebody had logged in. But the thing I really liked about them was I got onto their blog feed, and they would send out things like, oh, these plugins have been re removed from the WordPress repository because of vulnerabilities. And oh, wow, I never heard of that before. So I'd go in, pull those out, I'm not going to use those anymore. Parts of my website would break, I'd replace it with what I needed to, and then I'd be back in business. But I really like that part. And then uh, about a week or two ago, I was trying to update my website, and I kept saying, access denied. What? Why is he access denied? I'm the administrator. So I took off WordFence, and everything went away. <laughs> it worked again. So I don't currently have WordFence installed, but I liked it. Uh, initially for what it did for me. On the anti-spam site, of course, the Kismet is typically um, put on there automatically, especially if you have a WordPress.com account, you can sign up for Kismet. But, and if you're uh, a stickler for following the rules, they basically they say that it's for personal use only, so if you're running a business, typically you shouldn't use the Kismet unless you pay for it and make it a premium. So I switched to anti spam B, which is a free one and seems to work fine. What's it called? Anti spam B. Oh. The, the second one on the oh. list. And another one I saw up there was WP Bruiser. I haven't tried it out, but uh, it's another popular one based on the number of active installations. For search engine optimization, the big one, of course, is Yoast. Then there's all in one, and then Jetpack, which is Jetpack is kind of like the kitchen sink of plugins. It does everything or tries to do everything. So you can actually do um, SEO stuff and uh, you can do site statistics with it, with it, which is good. And about I'm going to guess maybe half of the plugins in the Jetpack group are free, and the other half you have to pay for. It. So you can do backups with them. You can do contact forms for free and you know a bunch of stuff. I've used Yoast but not the premium version, only the free version. And after a while I thought I'm not even sure why I'm using that. Because once you read here's all the things that they say are good, I could do that without having a plug in tell me whether I'm doing it or not. But it works fine. And then I found there was something it does that I couldn't do I, I would have to install another plugin to do, and that had to do with um, setting whether a page was searchable and stuff like that. So I kept it on the site so I could I could mark those pages. I didn't want to have searched or uh, visible to the outside world. I could keep them hidden that way. Service related, if you're linking up to anything, you're going to need a plugin that can handle your Mailchimp account or your Send in Blue account. Uh, your PayPal, Stripe, or Braintree. Uh, if you're doing a third-party shopping cart, you can actually set up a, a store on a third-party <coughs> site and they'll take a fee from you and you don't have to manage everything within your WordPress site. Um, Shopify is a really big one. I've used Equid, um, which I haven't, I haven't sold anything, but I've got it up and running. It seems to work okay. Uh, Shopply is for digital downloads and Patreon is one I just came across that does um, content where if you build a following through your content, you get paid for, they, like they pay a monthly fee to read your content, and you get a, you get a piece of that. Can you go back to that one? What was the last one? Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. So I think they had some, I came across it from a journalist site that they said, oh yeah, Go to my Patreon site, and you as, as you read, then they you make money, stuff like that. So, as an author, I thought that might be kind of interesting. 
disaster recovery, backups, moving to another host. Um, here's some of the ones you can use. I've used the number three all-in-one migration because I was moving from one hosting provider to SiteGround. And the nice thing about that was you just install the plugin, say export everything, database, users, you name it, export it. Then you go to your new um, host, set up a WordPress site, say load in the plugin, say import this, and now you've got your site back. So to me, I mean that's as good as a backup. Um, if you want to, if you want to do it often and just keep exporting, you can do that. <coughs> the other thing I came across and this is only within the last couple of weeks, is these multi-site managers. Now, I'd heard of them before. I'd heard of main WP, which you can actually run from your computer as a main WordPress site that you can then update all your other sites from. Um, I didn't want to spend time setting up a separate WordPress stack on my, co my computer, so I went with Manage WP, which is also free. And uh, I can pull up the dashboard, I can see six websites right across there. It says these 19 plugins need updating. I go, update them, and it goes and updates every site for me. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. And if you're not into automation, you can have it do the security check for free. You just have to tell it when, I mean, like now, I'm going to do the security check and it'll do it for that site. If you pay, and it, the rates are pretty cheap, it's like a dollar a month or two dollars a month, you can schedule the security checks, or you can schedule backups, you can schedule a bunch of different things that they will handle for you. So I thought that was pretty cool. Page Builder. Why is Page Builder a must or a should be a core plugin? There's three of them that I picked here, there's a bunch more. Um, Beaver Builder, when I first got into this, seemed to be the big one that everybody at most WordCamps out at seemed to be working on with Beaver Builder. A um, guy at work that does a lot of our website development, big Beaver Builder guy. But the second, first or second WordCamp I went to, they were talking about Elementor. And, oh, okay, well, I'll try that. It's got a free version. So I pulled down the free version. Oh, man, this is really great. And then I, got the, then I bought the pro version. Uh, this is even greater. And the nice thing is it allows you to reduce the number of plugins you have because page builders do so many things themselves. I don't need a separate contact form plugin. I can use page builder. I don't even need a membership login if I don't want the extra functionality. It's got a basic login form. I don't need a separate, like the lady before was saying, well, if you need, if you want these other icons for sharing social media, you got to pay for the theme. Oh, no, I don't. I just add them in my page builder, and voila, I'm done. I have Facebook, I have Instagram, I have Snapchat, I've got LinkedIn, I've got Google Plus, I've got everything. And it's all already built into the page builder. So, I'm going to go out on a limb here. <coughs> Fairly thin limb, so it'll probably break. But it's a bold prediction that themes are going to be useless in the future in WordPress because page builders will do everything a theme will do. So I started thinking about that as, as uh, Sheila was talking. I thought, you know, really all a theme does is it presents the framing of the house. And the page builder is all the other stuff. I can do headers, I can do footers, I can do logos, I can do, I can have different pages look different. I can save them as templates and reuse them wherever I want. I can export them and put them in on, on another site. I don't care what the theme is anymore. It doesn't matter. So I'm assuming, and I'm not real big on, on the core uh, coding of, of WordPress, that that's really what the theme does. It sets the structure that all these plugins use to extend its functionality. And I think the page builders Elementor just came out with blocks. So now I can say, oh yeah, I want a, uh, I want a three column block with, with pictures. Okay, here's the block, boom. Now all I gotta do is modify it to my needs and I'm done. And I can save it as my block and I can use it elsewhere. So, I don't know, I've done, so the one that I didn't add to this list that I thought about when Sheila was talking is 
is child theme creators. If you do work in themes, and I've had to customize some themes a little bit, you always want to create a child theme first and customize that. And that way, if you have to upgrade your theme, it's not going to break any specific customizations you've done um, prior to that. So that's the benefit of that. And there are some plugins that actually will allow will do the, the uh, copying of the theme for you into the child theme. And you can have multiple child themes if you want them to look different, you know, whatever. So I would add that to the list. Um, but, you know, you can, with Elementor, I've got a MailChimp plugin already set. I don't have to get a separate one. I don't even have to use the code from MailChimp and build the forms that they give you. I can do landing pages, I can do galleries, I can do sliders. Um, <clears throat> and, and as they keep coming out with new stuff, you're just going to get more. And then the other thing that a lot of plugins will have is extensions to them that give them additional capability that they either haven't built in yet or they aren't going to build in. So initially, Elementor didn't handle headers and footers, and somebody wrote an extension to them, so I can say, ignore the themes, headers and footers, I want to create my own. And uh, if I use a certain canvas, boom, I've got my own headers and footers, and the theme, to me, is invisible. So let's look at the goals of e-commerce sites if you're running a store and what plugins might be useful, and then we'll look at a couple examples of some of these sites to see what they're doing. Obviously, the first goal is you want this visitor on the site as long as possible. You want them to buy your products. And if you have a site where they can buy again later, you want to become a member so you can alert them, hey, there's something I want you to look at you might be interested in buying. So plugins for them, obviously, store or shopping cart, the big one is WooCommerce, and I've started using WooCommerce on one of my sites. It is hugely capable, it's got tons of uh, different capabilities, and it's got a ton of extensions that you can either buy or add on uh, for free to do different things. So if you're selling a lot of stuff, this would be a good thing to use. If you're selling just a couple of things, then to me it's overkill. And so you have to be careful of, am I putting something on because a million people put it on or because it's doing what I want it to do? And so initially I started out with WP Simple PayPal Shopping Cart, gave me a PayPal connection, it allowed me to put in a few things that I could then be off and running. Uh, another one I tried out is Equid, which is a third party one. Um, but again, you set up the stuff, it's basically hosted on another site that links to your site. And there's, you know, and this one didn't cost me anything, whereas Shopify, which is the big one, you better be selling a lot of stuff because it's an expensive uh, add-on. <clears throat> I think it's like thirty or forty dollars a month uh, just to use it. Uh, if you're doing just digital downloads, uh, the easy digital digital downloads is a specific plugin that that's all they do, or supposedly all they do. Um, a third-party one called Shopley does the same thing. Uh, in the WooCommerce, I added an extra extension of theirs that said digital downloads, so I could do digital downloads that way. So you can, there's a bunch of different ways you can do these things. It's a matter of how do I do it most efficiently for my site that causes the least amount of problems. Because the more plugins you have, the more chance you have for conflicts and, and issues. Payment processing, PayPal, Stripe, and Braintree. There's a bunch of other ones also. PayPal and Stripe are typically offered on almost on the majority of plugins. Uh, Stripe not always for free. You might have to go premium to get Stripe. Uh, if you want to go to the higher PayPal processors, you have to usually pay for those as well. The basic PayPal uh, connection typically works on anything. And then if you're doing subscription membership, um, paid membership pro, ultimate member and members are a couple and there's a bunch of others. And those are, <clears throat> one of the things you can do and I've done a lot is I'll go to a site like WP Beginner or one of these others that does comparisons and just try to read, okay, how are you comparing these, what do they do? 
and I can get a feel for, yeah, this, this does what I want to do, this one doesn't. And as a basic thing, I think that's pretty good. I can then start wheeling it down and start loading them up, looking at them, seeing how easy they are. Some things will say, oh, we're real easy. There was a form, I can't remember the name of it now, magic form or something. It's real easy, there's no coding at all. It's just point and click, and it's like, okay. And so I put a form field up, and I put another form field up, and okay, I want a third form field over here. And I couldn't get the field over there for the life of me. I'm like, come on, I kept putting it down in the second row. I'm like, well, make them this way. Nope, then it's one per row. I'm like, okay, I give up, take it out. If I can't do it something in like 15, 20 minutes, forget it. I don't have that time to waste. So <clears throat> Amazon, of course, is the biggest e-commerce out there. I figured I'd start with them. And this is what I would call a broad e-commerce site. They sell everything under the sun. So their products are all over the place. They're up on the very top. They're in the middle on the slider. And they sell products to their products. So it's all over the place. They've got a search button, a bar, so you can look for products to buy. And they can track you, so they can see what did you look at last time, in case you still want to look at it again. Um, so that's a, uh, an example of a broad e-commerce site. Then there's one called Focused e-commerce, and I, I made this up, so I'm not copywriting it or trademarking it, anybody can use it. Basically, you're selling one thing or one type of thing only. In this case, even though it's difficult to read, this is Blue Bottle Coffee, so they're selling coffee. And they've got the search bar, they've got the products, they've got a lot of white space. And I think if you're selling one thing, white space matters. It makes it much easier for people to find things and, and evaluate it versus on Amazon, you've got everything out there on some of these other sites too that are stores, you have everything out there. And you have to kind of weedle through them. But if you're only selling one thing or one type of thing, keep it simple. So let's look at content sites. <clears throat> the goals and plugins for those. You don't really, you want to keep them on as long as possible, but you want them clicking. You want them clicking on links, you want to click clicking on your affiliate stuff, and if they buy, then you'll get money for that. So you have plugins for affiliate links, things like uh, Easy As On, Ease On, Thirsty Affiliates. You have ads with quick AdSense, advanced ads. You've got remote content update. Let's say you're running a site where you have a bunch of other authors sending content to you. You can use the basic Jetpack email plugin to have it email it in, or you use something like you have submitted posts or posty. Um, I'm sure there are some other ones out there as well. You can also do front end editing. Uh, with things like page builders where they don't have to log in, they can go right in that itself. User management, um, you can do things for email subscribers and newsletters, uh, add to any share buttons, there are a couple of them. And here's a content site, and of course content is everything, so they show it in the uh, same thing up here is offered down here, you can see it on multiple places. All the links will go to things that they get money from if you buy you know, because they're an affiliate. This one, same thing, multiple places that do the content. And they'll even put in a little disclaimer to tell you, hey, this is an affiliate site. We make money because they're clicking on this. I like the sites that do that, that are that way I know that um, I know who I'm helping out. And then I <laughs> talked to this guy at work and I said, yeah, and if I don't really want to help them out, I'll go later by myself over here. And he said, well, you know, if the cookie's there, they're going to get paid anyway. <laughs> I said, only if I'm on the same computer. <laughs> so lead generation sites. These are big on sales. You want to get the visitor to sign up so they can try to sell them something. You want a contact form. Just go pass that. That's all it was. You want testimonials so they know that uh, real people value your service or whatever it is you're providing. You want, them, you want them to get onto your mailing list because from what I've read, mailing list is king. Everything goes by your mailing list. And uh, you want a landing page. So the first time I set one of my sites up, I used WordPress landing pages. 
And then they also said, oh, well, if you want under construction, there's an under construction page. You notice on every single one of these, Page Builders does the same thing. So why would I want five different plugins if I can just use one and get all that functionality? And that's why I will always promote Page Builders every chance I get. Because to me, they're just, once you learn them and understand how they work, it just breathes to manage your site with. I can do landing pages in, in Elementor. They even have default landing page templates set up. I just can choose one say, yes, one I like. I'll put it up. It's for this kind of a sale. And then I'll tweak it to the way I want to tweak it. Here's a, a lead gen site that I was looking at using uh, Friday night and changed my mind. So the big thing is you want to appeal to the customer. This one, they're actually trying to get you to become a Lyft driver. And then you want an action. And after reading on some of this, it's like the less you have on the landing page, the better. You want them to be able to click in one spot or typical landing page, it's about five feet long. You want them to click in one of five different spots, but it's always going to take them to the same place. You don't want them to usually go somewhere else on your site. Brochure sites, though, are a little bit different. So there you're trying to build credibility for the customer, and you want them to typically either call you or email you. So some of these same things, forms, contact forms. You can, I even threw in some form builders, and I'll talk about them in a second. Um, one place I was reading said brochure sites are really passe now. They're no longer um, considered useful, I guess. I don't know. I'm not sure what the guy was trying to get at. But he felt that they should all be landing page type sites. Um, I haven't made up my mind what I think about that. The one drawback with using form builders that I've come across so far is you have to be ready to code. So I used Gravity Forms trying to test something out. I used Caldera Forms. I said, OK, I'm going to try to show the difference between the two, what they look like, how easy is it. And with, with anything I did with them, I either had to put in HTML somewhere, or like he, he showed me a site they did, and he said, oh yeah, we use, we use uh, Gravity Forms. He said, you have to use CSS everywhere in order to make it look the way you want. I said, well, that's not good. I don't want to use CSS. I want to click on things and have it do what I want it to do just by selecting something instead of having to know, oh, yeah, throw this code in here and then throw this code in here. It's like, no, no, no. I'm not, I mean, I'm a developer during the day. I'm not a developer at night. So I want to assemble a website that works. I don't want to code one. Because what's going to happen? Sometime there's going to be an upgrade and it's going to break your code. Galleries, same thing. I've used NextGen, which was a nice gallery. There's some other ones for showing pictures. And the page builders have galleries. So why do I need a separate plugin? I'll just use my page builder. Now, that being said, a lot of the functionality in the page builder may be basic. So if you want to do more than a basic membership login, if you want to have tiered membership levels and subscriptions and all that, you may have to go to a separate plugin that has all that functionality. But as, as an initial start to say, I just need something to begin with, just use your page builder and see if it satisfies you until you need something more. Here's a brochure site. This is for air conditioning. So right up at the top, they give you their phone number, call for an appointment, request one. They tell you what they do, they sell air conditioners. Exciting site? No, but if you're looking for air conditioning companies, you might say, okay, there's one. <laughs> Could it be more exciting? Oh, yeah. We fix broken air conditioners in five minutes. Hey, I've got a broken air conditioner. I'll call them. So it all depends on what you're appealing to. Here's one for plumbing. Family owned and operated. They tell you to call them at their number. They tell you what they do, plumbing but there's no specifics. So how do I know what they're good at? Are they good at everything? <clears throat> Here's another plumbing one. They have a number to call. They say they have affordable plumbing services. How do I know that they're affordable? Affordable to me may not be affordable to you. So 
what's one of the things this sales guy I was reading was talking about. They'll boast, they're number one in this, or this, best in this. He said, that doesn't mean anything. Unless you can show something that says, these people were rated you know, number one on Angie's list, or number one in the best of the area survey last year, something like that. So it's always, you always want to be careful, and that's why they say go with testimonials, because now I know, hey, this is a real person who had your service, and this is what they thought about it. That carries more weight. They also use stock gallery pictures. The sales guy said that's a waste of time. It doesn't do anything. If you don't want to take a picture of something you actually did or are working on, then, then don't put any stock photography up there. So when I was looking for landscape services, it was perfect because they showed actual pictures of the work they had done. I could look and say, oh yeah, wow, that looks really good. Nope, that doesn't look good. And I could choose a, a different landscape company based on the pictures of their work itself. So that's just a couple extra things I threw in there for the fun of it. <clears throat> so now the bonus feature, holy cow, what was that? <laughs> What's important to you? Let's compare apples to apples, and it's a free tool for you to use. Now, why did I do this? Because uh, I had extra time and it just felt like it. And I'm an engineer, and engineers tend to do things in numbers more often than not. So <clears throat> what I decided was, you know, every time I read these comparisons of here's the top ten plugins for this, and here's the top five for this, a lot of times what I'll see is, wow, this one does five colors. I don't care about five colors, come on. I mean, they give you things that I don't care about or that aren't important to me, or they rate them as, well, this one's best because I know this developer, he's just a cool guy. But that doesn't matter to me. I don't care if, they still, I don't, if there's only one developer, I'm a little worried. What happens if something happens to them? So I decided, well, what if you had a tool where you could rate it yourself based on things that were important to you? So if you set the criteria, he said, I'm going to weight each criteria a certain way because this is more important to me than that. And on their website, it might not have been. I want to come up with my own rating scale. I want to come up with the value on that scale that I think that plugin met. And then I'll see the score, and I can compare and say, OK, which ones do I want to start looking at first because they scored higher? And it's just a simple spreadsheet, which you can't really see from back there. But basically, <coughs> I've got criteria over here. I've got a weighting scale that says, oh, this is worth 20% of, on a scale of 1 to 10. Values of 3, so the score is a 6. Sum it up, and you get a total score at the bottom. And then you can say, oh, OK. I'll look at that plugin first, and then this plugin second. Because no matter what you do on any of these comparison things, whether you're reading a best of, or the top 10, or whatever, you're not going to know until you load it on your site and play with it whether or not you're going to work with it well. You know, so I've, you know, I'll talk to somebody and say, eh, I didn't like Elementor. Why not? Eh, I had to do this. Well, that was because he was familiar with Beaver Builder, and Beaver Builder did it this way. So when you realize how you work, you'll, you'll find certain plugins work the way you like to work, and other ones won't. Even if somebody raves about the other one, you'll be like, can't use it. I just, I just can't. I looked at it, it was all code to me. Yes, ma'am. Could you just read off those categories on the Yeah, left? so the categories I put up there as an example is uh, number of installs. <coughs> so if I'm looking at the WordPress.org site and I get a listing and it's got 20 on the page, and I look and say, okay, well, what are the number of installs in that? that uh, plug-in. And then, when was it last updated? Was it updated a week ago? Was it updated six years ago? Um, how many functions does it do? Now this is where it gets really difficult because it's hard to look at a plug-in and tell right away how many things it does. But if you can get a sense for it, well, that might do five things, that might do ten things. Or, or these are the functions I need and it does all of them. Uh, you can do that. <clears throat> then I looked at, is it on the current version? because on the WordPress site, they don't take them off even if the last version it worked with was 3.5.6. And so I want to know that if it's not on the current version, it better only be one version back. 
and the current version should have just come out yesterday. Otherwise, or it's such a generic plugin that they'll say it's tested with the current version, even though they haven't updated in six years. But it works because it's just a basic plugin. And then I looked at the star rating. You know, what did other people rate it who actually tried to use it? And then the number of developers. You can look at the, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's the distribution, whether it's contributions or contributors, and they'll show you who has worked on the plugin. Well, if I see one guy and I see another plugin that has like nine people, I'm going to lean towards the one with nine people because I think there might be more support for it. I could be wrong. I mean, I don't understand these things 100%, but I would say it's more important to me to have a plugin that has a team working on it than a plugin relying on one guy. And I know that may be biased, but and I and I've used plugins that are by one guy and they're and they work fine. But I'm always leery when I first start out, especially with a new one, uh, that I don't have a lot of um, feedback from other people that say, "Oh yeah, this is a great plugin." The guys always on top of it, and 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 some of them even if person stops developing it, somebody else may pick it up. So if it's a popular one, I think that's what happens. If somebody else will pick it up and say, yeah, I'll, I'll take it off from you if you're tired of doing it now. And uh, because of the, they know WordPress, they know PHP, you know, it's, just, it's all the same. You can do any of those. <laughs> so if you have any other questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. We're at, um, 11.44, so the lunch line has probably already started. <laughs> oh, I didn't uh, the one that had my... plugins. Excuse me? Membership plugins? Yes. Membership, membership plugins. Yes. Um, Any experience? I've had very limited experience with them, but I've, the guy that I work with who has had a lot, he likes paid membership pros because it gives you a lot of the capability for uh, setting tiers and Subscription levels and stuff like that. Paid membership pro. I've looked at using the members plugin because there's another plugin I want to use called Pods, and I just haven't had a chance. It took me a year to figure out how I would use Pods, and then once I figured out, I'm like, oh man, this is like the greatest thing, and I just haven't had a chance to use it. But it works with members itself. Oh, yeah, it's um, Soul Attitude Press. Soul Attitude Press. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice meeting you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're going to send me those, those notes. Enjoy lunch and the rest of the camp. It's a privilege to uh, speak with you. And I'll be in the happiness bar after lunch and then tomorrow morning as well. Uh, question. I'll be doing a program about copying your website. Yeah. Which program did you say you use? All-in-one migration. And does that also allow you to send the backup to your FTP server for off-site backup? Yeah. Well, that's basically what it does. It basically, um, Can I just it's, it's basically it takes a backup across yeah. your, your website. And you can choose how much you want. So, but I typically say, give me everything. I want the whole thing. So, so you can use that to do backup? So it includes, it includes your database and all your user information and all your website content. And, it, and it basically you say, Export it, and it'll export in a zip file to your hard drive, with your wherever you want it. You can to go. shoot it off the site. Exactly. You're off site, and then I go to a new site, and I create a WordPress installation, uh, and then I add that plugin, and then I say now import, and I grab a zip file, and it. Because I used a couple of them, something called WP Chrome. Yeah. Awful. It didn't. Um, <clears throat> I guess they have a lot of 404 errors. Yes, oh, okay. so it won't do it. Oh. So will the copy even will it neglect or negate rather the parts of the website are broken or is it just zip it all? It takes everything, whatever's there, it takes it. I'm not sure if you want to 